بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء رسولنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أوكي. أولا أشكر اللجنة المنظمة للمؤتمر لدعوتي وثانيا أشكركم أخوانا للحضور وأتمنى إن شاء الله أعذروني أنني أتكلم وأنا جالس لأنه I have replacement of my knees and the legs as well, the two knees and the two legs. So please excuse me. My talk will be about the effect of grain refiners on aluminum alloys, aluminum and steel alloys, grain refinement. Okay. On the grain refinement of aluminum and steel alloys. The paper is there and you will see it, but I want something which I got two experiences which I would like the young scientists to learn from it. One was from Professor G. I. Taylor, everybody knows him, the man who has got Sir G. I. Taylor from Queen Elizabeth due to his, he's the man who published in math, in physics, in chemistry, in engineering. Now, the first paper I published was 1971. I worked, I didn't finish my MC at that time. I was with Professor Johnson at UMIS, University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. So I tested his theory. G.I. Taylor has a published theory in 1948 with other four scientists, two Germans, one the Naval Weapon Center, Pearson, and another one. So it didn't appeal to me at that time that this does not work because he published it pure physics. He considered it as water, going in mud, because the English who published the bazooka, the bazooka. So when the, so, sir, when the soldiers came, he asked them, how was the German tanks working against our bazooka? He said, they said it was like water jet in mud. So he took this and he, published, he wrote a paper and agreed with the others on pure physics. So he put a nice theory. Now his theory says that lead will penetrate more than aluminum depending on the density, function of the density of the material. I, thought, I thought, you know, as a young scientist I was, I didn't publish anywhere at that time. I wanted to test it because I want theoretical work in my thesis. I tested the theory, it didn't work. Because aluminum was supposed to be less than lead. Lead was the lowest material. I tested 12 materials, lead was the lowest. I repeated the test 10 times. Every time I get the same results. So I went to Professor Johnson, I said, Tom, this Taylor's theory doesn't work. He laughed. He said, Zaid, don't criticize Taylor. Nobody can say anything about Taylor. So I said, Tom, this is what repeat the results. I told him 10 times I repeated it and it's very repeatable. He said write the paper. I wrote it and sent it for publication. Of course they would send it to whom? To G.I. Taylor to refer you. He phoned Johnson. I was the first author on the paper. He phoned Johnson. He couldn't answer him. He asked his secretary to call me to answer the phone. So I went on the phone. I said well, what I have to do with G.I. Taylor? He wants a Professor Johnson. She said no Johnson sent me to you. So I went there. I spoke, he said, Zaid, this is an excellent piece of work, but if you allow me, then, because I said in the paper, this contradicts Taylor's and Ital theory, Taylor and his group. So what happened? He said, it's an excellent piece of work, but allow me to add one sentence. I said, please. He wanted to say, this is the, was the breakthrough for me to, to really respect science and scientists. He said, I would like to add a sentence, if you don't mind, due to the lack of experimentation at that time. The paper was 1948. He wants to write it due to the lack of experimentation in the experimental work at that time, Ajizim. And it was a very small variable which I designed. It was only a piece of heavy metal and a stylus which goes through to the deep of the, the cut, the depth of the cut. And believe me, that man at the paper is still there, published in the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, and he didn't add that sentence. This, I respected him very much for this. 
Now, I would like also for the young scientists to follow this work. Now, normally, people do not go to the origin of the work. All my papers, I always write as early as, because you have to give, to get, to give the credit to the own people. Now, this paper, the Green Refinement, which has given me the Nobel Prize, nobody dares, if you open the net, you will not find any names except me and Dr. Safan. Is he here, Dr. Safan? Unfortunate. He was my first student. He took his BC project with me, his Master of Science with me, and his doctorate with me. He, now he is at the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering in Zaytuna University. So the second learning was to go to give the people their credit. Now this work on grain refinement, which, has a, which I have got the Nobel Prize on it, the grain refinement, because I have around 87 papers on it. Safan was the first one to work on it, his BC project, and his MEC project, and his PhD project. Now, the grain refinement was discovered, all science, all science, the, the, the big rules and the big found funds, findings were by normal people, by chance, accidental. Now, this was discovered, the grain refinement, by a BC engineer who was working in an aluminum foundry in Brazil. Sibula his name. Now, he was working in the refinery. He was working on aluminum. He gets the aluminum, the ingots, and then after he gets it, he tests it mechanically, takes a few pieces. The mechanical properties are the same. One day, he found that the mechanical properties of this batch was 25% extra. He's not a metallurgist, he's a mechanical engineer. So he went to his colleague, who is a metallurgist. At that time, there was no scanning electron microscopes. This was in 1950, at the time. So he analyzed it, you know, the normal method, chemical analysis. He said, him, this has got titanium in it. That's the only difference between this and the previous batches. He wrote it in 1950, 1951, he published it in the Journal Institute of Metals. So I got hold of this paper because I go always back to the one who really discovered the phenomena. Now I'm not a metallurgist, I'm a mechanical engineer. So I didn't understand how to get this small amount because we t they called it micro alloys because you add it in micron level. The percentage of titanium was 0.002 percent by weight. Now this one you cannot by weight by because if you <laughs> do it that it will go off, you can't see it. So what I did, Professor Ahmed Abdul Hamid, if he's living, God give him mercy and if he's not living, he's an Egyptian. He was graduated from the Sorbonne. I told him I want to learn how to get microalloys. They call it micro alloying because it's very small quantity. He said, Adnan, this is a long history. I said, okay, I want to learn it. He was visiting a professor. I served at the Faculty of Engineering in the Applied Science University in 1997. He said, I want to go out of Egypt. So I brought him to the Applied Science University. He was there. I used to go. I told him, let me enter your lectures. He said, no, if you enter my lectures, I cannot speak a word. I said, please, I want to learn. He said, no, come at night time. I can stay with you until 3 o'clock in the morning until you learn it, which I did. Every night I used to go to him to learn how to make this microalloying. So I published with him three papers. He said, Adnan, he's a very religious man. He said, this is not right. I said to him, I learned it from you. You have the credit for it? She said, no. I have graduated thousands of students, but they, they never even published my name over knowledge. And he wrote me a letter saying, this is your work. Please don't write my name on these papers. So I got hold of this work and started working on it. Now they used to call it microalloying at that time. Now, because it refines the grains, now imagine the normal grain of aluminum is 1,000 
2,000, sorry, 1,250 microns. If you add this percentage of titanium, which is 0.002 percentage, it goes right to 170. So I got hold of the subject and I started trying like titanium, the other materials, which I called them rare earth metals. The ones which you use in Mendeleev words, they were at the end, the heavy metals, zirconium, tantalum, boron, etc. So I tried to, to get hold of these. I called them rare earth materials. They are very expensive due to their rare in the in earth. The percentage of them is very rare. Now, I tried all these metals. Now, the, the beauty of that is to much, the, the most tedious subject, I was to say it for the young scientists who will really to follow. Now, you cannot put this in quantity, the 0.02 by weight. So you have to establish first, which is very tedious process, is the master alloy. The master alloy is to have a big ingot of aluminum and puts from these rare materials one gram in it or half a gram, whatever you have, and then you have to make solid solution in it and remelt it again and spread it on a cast iron base. You cannot spread it except on cast iron. Otherwise, if you put it on mild seal, first of all, sorry, the, the crystal should be pure graphite, pure graphite. Otherwise, if any elements goes in it, carbides will not do. It will change the whole thing. If any metals go inside, it will change everything. So cross weld must be graphite, pure graphite. Now we don't find cross welds in the, the market. You cannot find graphite. So I told them, where can I get graphite? My colleagues and the brothers from Pakistan, I asked there all in Pakistan, in Syria and Lebanon to get a graphite cross weld card. Nobody has graphite. All of them is carbide, the graphite. So I, saw, I asked people, how can I get graphite, pure graphite? Professor Hisham Hamdan in Jordan University in the electric department, he said only you can get it from the column, from the uh, power stations. I have a student was in the power station. I phoned him. I said to him, I want to get, you remember? <laughs> I said, if I want a graphite, a graphite piece. He said, you are lucky. We ordered 10, one is broken. Do you have a student to come and take it? I said, yes. So one of my students was a MC student, he went to his car and he brought it. Now the problem was when he machined it. So when he machined it to the workshop, all the, the technicians has gone out, went up because all the dust has come <laughs> black. You know the graphite is very dirty, black. So he said, what will we do? I said to him, I'll take permission from the dean, it was Dr. Hassan Zabalawi, to allow us to use it in the weekend when the workers are not there and one technician to work more me, the cross bills. And for that column, which was one meter length and 35 centimeters, I was using it all the time and I'm still using it. And anybody asks for a cross bill, we always give, give him a cross bill of pure graphite. Now this is very important for people who wants to follow. Don't use except pure graphite cross bill, otherwise all the results will not be reliable. Not at all in that one. Sorry, this is a long story, but it is very important because the paper is in there and I will go through it quickly. You can follow it in the, in the proceeding, but the most important is how to follow these things. Okay, thank you for this. <laughs> we'll go to the presentation, please. Give me my laptop. Yeah, presentation. Yeah, here. I want the laptop, please. Ah, that yeah. The general fundament for aluminium and alloys. لا أعطيني يا تلم. غير شيء الفرق بتعمل عملية فقدت عملية فرق بتي. أحطه لك. أنا أركض أحطه. أركب تبع حطه. أوكي. أوكي برادر. شكرا.
ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing about these elements, which I use them for grand refinement, that they are not additives. This was the finding, which was first reported by me, that they are not additives. One, one grain refiner is good, it's very good refiner. He reduces the grains. The second, another excellent grain refiner, if you add them together, they become a poison. They increase the grains. That's one thing. The other way around, if you have a poisoner grain refiner, like zirconium and tantalum, those are poisonous. They increase the grains of aluminium. If you put them together, they are better than titanium. This is the most amazing findings. And this was reported. After that, I tested all these refinements. None of them is additives together. All of them are not additives. And this is the rule. After that, I have got the Nobel Prize of, of this finding, actually. Now, for people who does not know about Nobel Prize, it has two Nobel Prize. On Al Jazeera, who watches the day before yesterday, there was a program by the committee which grants the Nobel Prize. So the chairman was saying the Nobel Prize is two. One is personnel for pure sciences, and this one is personnel, he gets the really money for it. But the most important for us is the Nobel Prize for serving humanity, because this is public for the whole people. Now, for humanity, you get it for your research work if you don't make patents and get from it money. And I have never beaten a paper from my papers, never. And all of them just publishing for people to use it. This is why granted me, and my Nobel Prize is written, this is given for him for, for serving humanity. This was written. The people who saw it in my house, they know Dr. Ahmed and the rest of my colleagues, and Dr. Iyad Sartaw, all of them, my colleagues, they come down, they see it. Now, this is the, the grain refinement, it's written in there. Now, one single grain refinement, it's a binary alloy, made of two. If there are two added together to the aluminum, it's a ternary alloy, two, three elements. I'll talk about the parameters which affect the process. Parameters related to aluminum and aluminum alloy. Because you can grain refine aluminum and its alloys with the same refiner. The purity of the material, the percentage. Imagine 99.99% purity aluminum is different from 99.9995 gives you different results for the same grain refiner. Parameters related to the grain refiner itself. The chemical composition of it, whether it is titanium, boron, titanium boron levels, they are two added together. Now, titanium boron, if you add, if you add boron, boron is not a grain refiner. But if you add it to titanium, it enhances its improvement 10 times. You add boron one to five, 10 times it becomes more efficient. Just by adding boron. Boron itself is not a refiner. If you add any quantity of it, it's not a refiner itself. Now the third one, third group is the parameters related to the process itself. How much you put the material when you melt it in the furnace. Soaking time, how much you soak it in the furnace. The second thing is the temperature, which will raise the furnace too. And the third thing is the quenching media for it. Imagine this curve of grain refinement. Now, if you exceed the refiner, it becomes empty. It's coarse in the grains, as you could see from this curve. After a certain level, it will become poisonous. So it's very critical to find the optimum value of the grain refiner.
this is some of the different adjectives. This is one of them, vanadium. So most of the work was to study these parameters, the grain refiners, on the mechanical characteristic and metallurgical, on the grain size, on all the mechanical characteristics, mechanical strength, hardness, fatigue life, corrosion, etc., etc. Those have been covered in all my papers. So you, nobody now, I cannot find except professor in India, Arjuna, from the Indian Institute of Technology, who has worked, he's a metallurgist, who worked on some metallurgical aspects of, the, of, the, of these grain refiners. But the other, nobody has worked on this except my papers and my students. That's right. These are some of the effects on other characteristics. I want to talk about the recent developments, people who want to follow on the work. Now, there is not a single theory so far. All the theories about the grain refinement are controversial. All of them, none of them works at all. One works for refinement. You cannot explain the poisoning effect if you exceed it. So there's still lack of a theory to explain how grain refinement and poisoning effects occur. There are several theories which are summarized in the paper, but none of them works. And I also wrote that it doesn't work due to so-and-so. We'll talk about the conclusions. The grain refinement of ingots by the binary aluminum titanium and the ternary aluminum titanium boron. I said boron, if you add it, it increases the efficiency of the grain refinement of titanium, although it's not a refiner. It's of vital importance for recent casting as it results in improvement of mechanical strength and surface quality. I forgot to talk about the surface quality. Apart from the strength, increasing the strength and mechanical characteristics, it improves the surface quality of aluminium. Beautiful, it makes it. Extensive research work is being and is still carried out for the development of a new grain refining master alloys. Now they are available by the way, these master alloys, aluminium titanium, aluminium titanium boron are available commercially. Belgian sells them. You don't need to manufacture your master alloy. They send them ready already. You can buy them from the market. The addition of other elements, vanadium, molybdenum, zirconium, I have covered them. Commercially, pure aluminium grain refined effect by titanium, titanium boron, resulted in improvement of its mechanical behavior, fatigue life, and machinability, increased by the surface quality at different cutting conditions of speed, depth of cut, and feed rate. They improved the surface quality at all main parameters, cutting parameters, Depth of cut, improve the surface quality. No matter whatever the depth of cut, the feed rate and the speed, the cutting speed. Thank you very much for listening.